Ladies and gentlemen, my name's Paul, and once again I am here with Mr. Neil Trebit. This is part two of the interview, so you can check out the first part if you want to do so. It will be linked, of course, in the video description. How are you going, Neil? So happy to be back. Well, thank you for coming back. I should be thanking you for your time. <laughs> <laughs> So um, what we'll do, we'll uh, pick up right where we left off last time. We didn't have uh, quite enough time to throw this question in, but then we'll start getting more into compute, uh, mobile technologies and other bits and pieces. So uh, virtual reality, do, how do you believe virtual reality is going to evolve for retail customers, gamers, or you know, even more professional usages over the next few years? Uh, especially for gaming, uh, a lot of there's a lot of discussion at the moment that VR Dream is already dead. Do you believe that it has its teething problems, but we're going to start to see this evolve over the next couple of years? I mean, obviously, Cronus are pretty instrumental with helping to standardize uh, virtual reality. So what do you think is going to be happening? I definitely believe in virtual reality. I mean, uh, there's lots of press about you know, it's not as growing as fast as all of the uh, some of the more you know, breathless hype. But uh, that we've we've had earlier you know, in in the market. But um, from Kronos's point of view, you know, we we firmly believe in um, the need and the, the market need for AR and VR because OpenXR, the standard, you know, addresses both. Um, OpenXR, you know, one point zero is more focused on uh, virtual reality because that's the m most urgent need. You no, know, there are multiple VR runtimes shipping in the market today with all slightly different APIs you know, for no good reason other than all those APIs were created at, you know, by different companies at the same time. So, you know, of course, you know, they're, they're going to be different because there was no cooperation. So OpenXR, um, you know, from the standardization point of view, you know, it is the place where all of the um, VR runtime um, uh, SDK and runtime device manufacturers are coming to you know, get that cooperation into place so we can be you know, a lot less fragmenty <laughs> into, <laughs> into the industry, both for developers and um, you know, device input device uh, manufacturers. So I think OpenXR is going to be pretty key. Now, in terms of the overall market, the you know, uh, this, this is my personal opinion, you know, I think the don't believe the hype but don't believe the hype on the negative either, because the there the kind of there's the the gaming side and the consumer side, and then there's the professional side. I think on the professional side, you know, there's already um, applications, you know, training applications, medical applications that are that are absolutely proven to be effective, and that's a market that that will grow, um, and it, you know, is growing as we speak. On the consumer side, it's interesting. I think the we're, for many of the VR um, demos that are out there, they're, they're kind of interesting, but they're at the same kind of stage as AR, where you know holding, you know, um, a phone or, or you know, strapping a phone to your face it is interesting, but probably not going to change your life. Um, you know, you'll do it for a few times, uh, I think, and um, you know, maybe not do it over and over again. But I mean, th there's the, an obvious um, uh, market for uh, VR. You no, know, who, uh, you know, who out there is willing to invest in high-performance graphic systems and you know, um, spend more money than the average consumer? You now, it, it is you know, high-performance gamers. Um, so I think that that is kind of the next consumer market, and I think the enabling technology there is going to be higher resolution, um, because you know for for many game gamers they're moving to 4K monitors, um, and you know, I'm a flight simulator guy, <laughs> and I've tried VR you know, in my flight simulator, and it's quite immersive, but with the screen dooring and the lower resolution of uh, the current VR displays, you know. Um, I don't see the enemy coming before I'm shot out of the sky, so it's actually <laughs> like um, no, flying with uh, um, <laughs> foggy goggles. <laughs> Is that a technical term? The um, and so this is kind of this mismatch, mismatch where people that were, I, I would love to have you know, high resolution VR to do my flight simulator, but you know, and I think we're we're very close now. That the the display 
the HMD displays are, are getting higher re resolution, we can get rid of that disadvantage and then all the immersiveness uh, advantages kick in. And so I think you're going to see a bump um, in you know, uh, PC uh, VR for that market at least. I have also heard um, filmmakers were very interested in virtual reality or a more dynamic camera. So for example, let's say you were watching the classic slasher horror movie type of thing and you know you were in the camera essentially was in the in the woods you know and you were watching a chase scene so it was almost like you could have some from freedom of the camera as well but obviously this is stuff that's going to take quite a long time to kind of come to the generalized market as well right yeah, it's it's it, it is fascinating, and you know, you listen to some of the you know, creative folks trying to put together um, a VR content. Um, a, it you can see the potential, but B, you really end, begin to when you start listening to them, some of the cha challenges that you have in creating um, content that works. Not only does you know, the now, where do you put the cameraman? <laughs> yeah, you know, simple things. <laughs> and, yeah, not very really important. How... Just where's the yeah, just visual <laughs> position? <laughs> right, right. And you know, and how do you get the right balance between giving people the um, immersive capability to interact with the environment on their own terms, and how do you, how do you prevent them from wandering off completely and missing the whole storyline? You know that there, mm. it, it, it's a fascinating area, and I'm sure you know, lots of people are doing awesome you know, work in it. But it's there, there's quite a long learning cycle, I think, here to kind of master a new uh, medium and a new way of storytelling. Um, yeah, it's going to probably take a while. So there is a lot of confusion by a lot of folks of what the differences are between machine learning and deep learning. So could you give a synopsis of what the differences are? Well, I might be as confused as everyone else, but the the the, the way that the, <laughs> I, I look at it <laughs> is you know, the deep learning. The the, the word you know, deep comes from you know, the the the, um, the convolutional neural networks um, that typically have you know, multiple layers, and so you know, you're sending through the, the the training data and setting up the the parameters on on quite a deep convolutional neural network, and so. Now, deep learning is kind of talking that term is kind of referring to the topological shape of you know the the uh, the networks that you're running uh, for many of the you know, um, um, the these kind of artificial intelligence type uh, applications um, machine learning is when you begin to apply that kind of technology to um, you know, devices um, that can actually you know be trained or or more interestingly, you know, perhaps, and be deployed in the real world. And so you can begin to bring um, um, really intriguing and awesome pattern matching capabilities to you know, uh, devices that you know, increasingly are not, not going to you know, cost very much at all. You can have uh, you know, um, machine learning or inferencing, which is where you're using the trained network to you know, look at the video stream from your security camera, for example, to actually figure out whether something interesting uh, is going on. Um, so, yeah, I think we're on the verge of a revolution here where, because all this machine learning, deep learning, it, it, it's basically pattern matching where you can um, train a network to recognize patterns now, even if we don't know ourselves what the pattern is the the, you know, the training process can set up um, the uh, a mechanism by which um, these these patterns images you know sounds voices uh, video streams um, you no know, just arbitrary data patterns can be can be recognized and um, it's going to be a technology that is used everywhere throughout uh, the industry i think it, it is it is the next kind of fundamental technology that is going to change everything because you guys have also just released nnef which is for neural network exchange exchange as well right uh, that's yes. 1.0 that's right so that's aiming to essentially standardize right um for neural networks it it standardizes how you would uh 
take a trained network and put it into a low-cost inferencing device. So we're not trying to dictate to the world and um, how neural networks are trained and all of the you know, amazing research that's happening at such at light speed in the industry. That that's a huge topic, and um, you know, there are many companies and research institutes around the world that are doing awesome work on that. We, we've chosen a very uh, specific um, and small part of the overall puzzle um, where from the hardware vendor's point of view we saw a lot of industry fragmentation. Uh, fragmentation. Um, so and let me zoom out just a little bit. So the neural nets, there's two essential uh, stages for deploying a neural net in a product. One is you have to train your neural network, and that is um, typically needs a lot of precision, you know, 32 bit floating point operations. Um, it's uh, you can afford to do it on a high performance PC or in the cloud. You know, cloud is actually where most of the uh, training uh, happens, and it can take hours, days. Um, so that's the first stage, and that, that, that'll use one of you know, the dozens of frameworks out there, TensorFlow, you know, Cafe2, you know, and there's more and more frameworks every day. And as I say, there's a lot of innovation and change and you know, uh, evolution going on as we speak in, in that field. And then, then the second stage is once you have a trained network, that kind of knowledge is encapsulated, that pattern, ma pattern matching knowledge is encapsulated, in the topology and the weights of that final neural network. You want to lift that trained network and deploy it in a you know, low-cost consumer device, t typically. You know, it can be anything from a car, autonomous car, uh, you know, all the way down to you know, my security camera that I mentioned earlier that's you know, going to be looking at my video feed. And um, those consumer devices are typically going to be um, doing the inferencing you know, on device because you know, very often it's real time. You may not have connectivity, and th that that building that inferencing device is where the hardware guys come in. You now we're figuring out the you know, what are the best architectures to run a trained neural network on. You typically need less precision for inferencing than you do for training. Um, you know, and so there's a lot of competition out there. A lot of Darwinian evolution. Uh, my, my own company, you no know, Nvidia, you no, know, we we believe that GPUs are going to be it. Uh, there are other people you know, putting forward G, um, FPGAs, DSPs, you no know, specialized architectures. It's a very vibrant um, area with lots of you know, uh, good competition on, ongoing right now. So, so you have the training side and the deployment side or the inferencing side. How do you connect the two? How do you lift this trained network out of the training frameworks and put it into you know, a low-cost GPU or DSP-based device? And that's where the fragmentation is. We have dozens of training frameworks, each with their own proprietary file format, um, to, to hold this trained network. And you know, dozens, soon perhaps even hundreds of different you know, hardware chips and architectures that want to bring in this trained data. And that's a classic fragmentation problem. And so NNEF, uh, Neural Network Exchange Format, is a file format that you can grab the trained framework from any of the training uh, um, SDKs and, and have a hardware platform then only needs to import one file format, you know, NNEF, rather than having to understand dozens of different formats depending on how the network was trained. That's really awesome. I guess I have kind of a follow-up question for that, actually, mm -hmm. um, which is slightly, slightly. This is this one's like literally right off the cuff. Um, but obviously, you work for Nvidia. Um, yeah. How does Nvidia and the industry as a whole, but obviously from the point of view of a hardware vendor, how do you decide what's next, like what to put in next, how to move forward in the industry? Is it something you discuss with, let's say, other developer, uh, sorry, developers? Is it something that you kind of look at the the issues with the hardware, for example, things that you could speed up, or perhaps uh, power constraint issues, or is it like a mixture of like internal testing or what? How does it kind of, I, I guess what I'm asking is, how do you decide what's the next revolution? I think the 
t t speaking in g you know, general terms, the, it, the, the the spark of innovation comes from perhaps you know, to two two different directions. One is the kind of the incremental improvement direction, where you know if you have product out there, you know, that it can be a GPU, it can be anything, um, and you know, you're fortunate enough to have adoption in the industry, people using your product. You know, um, smart companies will make sure that they are really understanding what their their customers are doing, um, where are the bottlenecks that their customers you know, are hitting, you know, how how can we improve it. Um, so it's you know, learning how to incrementally improve uh, what you're doing from um, you know, gathering data on how your products are being used in the previous generation. Now that can give you lots of fuel to say, oh, God, we can do it so much better than that. Now we know this is the critical thing for you know, most of our customers, we can focus on that area for the next generation. Um, but then you have to, in general, you know, uh, also put into the the innovation pot, you know, the the unforeseen things. Because you know, I think Steve Jobs famously said, you know, the last people you should ask what your customers want is your customers, <laughs> because <laughs> you know, because they don't know, you know they, they don't know what's possible. So it's the, true. It's yeah. like gamers, most of the time, if you ask them, what do you want? Most gamers are going to, just for the sake of argument, say, well, I want to play at faster frame rates and higher resolution. Right. And it's not necessarily that that's... And I, obviously, I'm somewhat dictating here, but it's not necessarily best, because it's very easy to be like, well, I want, you know, 400,000 frames a second in a game, but do you really want that? Or do you also want better... Um, let's say physics right. or better artificial intelligence and all of this other stuff which actually goes in and I think gaming is actually simpler than let's say deep learning or something like that because there are so many more scenarios that you can go with that mm -hmm. right yeah yeah no I, I agree totally so you have to you know, um, have you know, research or you know, blue sky thinking going on somewhere you know, within the organization so you, know, you can actually come up with new technologies, new ideas that haven't been done before. And I think, you know, you need both of those in kind of equal measure um, to really drive a, a vibrant roadmap for any any product line going forward. Okay, cool. Um, so Walter Jai from Hawaii, from Hawaii recently said, uh, and I quote this short quote, people are using AI in their daily lives. And let's face it, it's true, right? Mm -hmm. Most people don't even realize they've used AI, whether it's something like, you know, voice recognition if you're saying hey google x mm -hmm. uh, or whether it's like um pattern recognition from photographs or whatever so how uh, i've got i guess i've got a couple of questions now that devices now are starting to actually accelerate ai on board how do these chips uh, tr uh change i'm oh, sorry differ from traditional gpus and cpus uh both in basic principle and also how developers uh, sorry how, how chronos are helping developers and also from a user's perspective do you feel that, um, how does a device even identify, let's say, a photo when it's done locally? Let's say if it's a photo of your cat from a, a basic functions point of view, like how does it actually recognize the pattern? Right. So, um, well, let's start with that, that one first. So the, how, how does um, your you know, video camera recognize it's your cat? <laughs> I'm not sure if any video cameras actually do that, but no, it's a good kind of general principle question yeah. the you know, how does a neural network re uh, recognize uh, any, anything i think uh, the new i think the pixel 2 can identify photos of like your cat i'm not sure how it works though yeah well it's it's the same principle they they're, they're just running an, a neural network and the you know the, the 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 enabling thing about a neural network is bef be before neural networks and deep learning the only way we had to get a computer to do something interesting was to program it, right? So we would need to know how to recognize a cat, right? That sounds trivial until you actually sit, sit, sit there with a blank piece of paper saying, okay, well, how do I recognize a cat? <laughs> <laughs> it's and, it's actually very difficult. Like, it, even if you're trying to describe a cat verbally, right. and then you were to, to say, describe, I don't know, a ferret or a possum, yeah. they've got a lot of characteristics. They've got four legs. They've got tails. You know, yes. they've got fur. It, it's, it's very subtle. It's very subtle. And then you have to cope with different lighting, different angles, and it quickly becomes completely impossible. And that uh, to to write a C program or JavaScript program to do that, because we don't know how we do it, 
is, is the bottom line. We don't know how we do it. So neural networks break that logjam by saying, okay, we don't have to describe how we're doing it. We just have to train a computer to do it. Basically, like we train a baby. It's essentially the same process. You know, computers do it faster, faster and better. But you know, we, we, a newborn baby, you, know, you start showing it pictures, right? Right? You know, when they're a few years old, and they that they figure out what a cat looks like. We're basically doing the same thing. We're running millions of images of cats <laughs> and other other objects, not just cats. <laughs> but, 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 pick on your example. You, know, you send millions of um, images of, of cats and other animals through a, a network, and you give it encouragement. You say, it says, it says, is that a cat? You say, yes, it is. Good, good neural network. <laughs> and you it shows a photo of an elephant. You say, bad neural bad, network. Bad, bad neural network. And so you give you no know, positive and negative reinforcement until um, you put in, and, and to, so it refines its guesses. And then, and there's a bunch of different ways you can do, you can train the network. And you know, there's way beyond my expertise to figure out all the de details, but the, the central process is the same. You're gathering a lot of data, you're sending it through the network and guiding it to, to the right decision, and eventually you will put in an image and it will come out with the right answer. And the, the there are two things that have happened in the last five years that have really enabled uh, AI to really take off, because this technology has been around for 20 years or more. It's A, we for the first time, have millions of pictures of cats, <laughs> or millions of pictures of, of, of anything. No, seriously, we, we, you need a huge data set uh, of input Im images or you know, other data types, but again, just focusing on images as an example. We suddenly have, with the internet, uh, literally millions of pictures of you know, pretty much anything you want to train on. And secondly, we do have to compute power. Now, for training, GPUs do, do dominate. And the fact that we figured out how to run these neural networks on GPUs for, for training means you don't have to wait six months. Like you have to wait for a baby. <laughs> no, you you can wait hours and you can train a network and that lets you, you know, incrementally Im improve the training. So, yeah, it, you, you're, just, you're just showing it lots of pictures and, and guiding it. So the the second question was, no, so what do you put into these chips to make that um, more effective? Um, on, the, yes. on, on the training side, um, because there's a lot of innovation um, and you need more precision in the training because you don't know the answers yet, you don't want to kind of get rounding errors before you know where the network's going to go, um, floating point um, and programmability are, are key, and so you know, GPUs are you know, the, the is the acceleration architecture that's that's giving a lot of bang for the buck there. On the inferencing side, your the, the basic operation that you're doing is um, is convolutions. You know, it, it's you're just doing lots and lots of multiply and adds, and once you've trained it. Uh, you don't need as much precision. You know, there's lots of research on going to how low can we go. You know, Eight-bit integer, in many cases, you know, provides perfectly good answers. Some people are even saying four bits or less. You no know, precision, for some architectures, you know, can give you, you know, all of the recognition a accuracy that you need. And so the the architectural innovation on the inferencing side is um, putting in uh, lots of multiplier accumulates. And uh, potentially at lower lower precision than 32-bit floating point, so you now you can pack more multiplier accumulates onto a chip you know, for the same power and cost. Um, that that is basically you know, in a in a nutshell the the race that's on right now. One of the key innovations that Nvidia had when it comes to HPC AI and compute orientated. Obviously, first of all, you guys have CUDA, but we'll get to that in a minute and uh, how it kind of goes in with the whole ecosystem. But you also have tensor cores as well, which is uh, utilizing, I believe it's TensorFlow. That whole technology is starting to emerge, and what a tensor core actually is in a very not, in, in a brief nutshell. Well, a, a, you know, TensorFlow will run on GPUs as well as you, know, um, you can basically run 
TensorFlow no, on, on any accelerator architecture if you put in the porting effort, but it definitely runs on GPUs as well as you know, more specialized uh, architectures. The it, it essentially comes down to the same same kind of um, efficiency question as for inferencing. You know, on the training side, you typically need more precision and more flexibility, but in the end, the essential um, operation that you know, is almost always the bottleneck uh, in any neural network is is the multiply uh, ads. So um, the question is, you know, how many multiply ads can you p can you pack onto an architecture that's going to give you for training the the flexibility and precision that you need you know, at the minimum cost and power. Um, so, and, and it's interesting, you know, the, uh, you can see why, you know, but some people um, are exploring dedicated architectures. You might say, well, you know, I don't need graphics, I don't need all, all the other stuff in a GPU, so why don't, don't I just focus? But the, that is actually, uh, for, I, mean, I, I work for NVIDIA, I, I can't help it, I, I believe in GPUs. <laughs> And so this is optimized my personal opinion. I'm not speaking for uh, other kernels members, but the, um, the there's been so many uh, different types of specialized hardware that have tried to compete with GPUs, you know, video uh, decoding, um, you know, physics processing, you know, the, and what typically happens when some oh you know this is a new thing we need to accelerate. What t t typically happens is specialized chips emerge and then it gets absorbed into GPU. Um, yeah, I remember Aegeus, was it Aegeus yeah, with Aegea, the physics? Aegea. Or, yeah, Aegea yeah, that's the, physics, back in the day. Yeah. I remember people were buying like one of those cards and combining that with, you know, a, a discrete graphics chip and then obviously Nvidia gobbled them up and now all of that's being handled through the GPU. So if you were to play, for example, Batman Arkham Knight and you've got this awesome I mean, I remember the first time I, I played Batman Arkham Asylum, and I just saw Batman's cape and all of the debris flowing on the ground, and it was just like, holy, like, wow, this right. this is so awesome. Yes, and as right, you said, it right. just, even back in the day with the, the various... Um, the various encoders and decoders, you know, the back in the day, you used to have to buy like MPEG cards and something. That's right, exactly. ridiculousness. Right. Right. <laughs> now right. it's just like your GPU or whatever is just handling all of it. Right, that's right, and, and in the end, it just comes down to economics. Um, uh, and actually, the same thing is happening in the mobile space with mobile SOCs. You know, like a, a latest generation mobile SOCs. The same kind of effect is going on. Is that that if you can pack the acceleration capability into a general purpose device, you know, that you can sell into lots of different markets, and you know, for GPUs, you know, it's the gaming market. You know, lots of other markets, the virtual reality market we we're just talking about. Now GPUs sell everywhere, and so um, putting this extra functionality into um, you know, a, a GPU that can be sold in much higher volume than any special purpose chip, but you know, potentially is gonna, always going to have the commercial uh, advantage in terms of you know, economics and cost. Um, distribution access to fabs, you know, the fabs, the co economies of scale uh, that, that kick in. Now, um, you know, it's a very interesting battle. People are battling it out. But uh, you know, my personal opinion is you know, GPUs have kind of won. There's kind of the, oh, God, you know, there's a new, uh, a new generation of uh, accelerator that we need. You know, history shows that GPUs are pretty hard to beat uh, for that reason. And you know, in mobile SOCs, the same thing. You know, the everything is getting absorbed into m mobile SOCs because they can ship in such high volume. The, the economies of scale kick in, so it's, you know, it's pretty hard you know, for mobile, you know, small you know, um, convenience cameras you know, to, to compete against the mobile phone now because you know, the mobile SOC has you know, an awesome amount of camera processing built, built in. So if I'm just building a camera chip <laughs> uh, for my point and shoot, you know, it becomes much more difficult uh, to, to compete because against that economy of scale. I mean, even cameras. I mean, as you mentioned, most cameras now, like most smartphones now, have like a really decent camera. I mean, 
-hmm. even a cheap smartphone has like a 12 or you know whatever megapixel camera and that's like on the low end a lot even have higher than that like 20 or what have you right and so a lot of these point and shoot cameras which were prevalent in the industry you know just in your local store like five years ago they've basically just gone bye-bye and now really the cameras are like for the more professional market you know like dslrs or whatever yep yeah no you have to um, if you're going to if you're going to be competing you know you have to differentiate against um you know, the, the 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 high volume uh vendors um speaking of this whole compute side of things as well and one of the reasons i wanted to get us a bit of a ground foundation uh Another thing Kronos have just released is Sickle 1.21, I say just, it was back in December, and mm -hmm. it's based on OpenCL, uh, that's 1.2 if memory serves. That's right. And well, that had um, it had about two and a half years of work behind it, right? Yeah, so Sickle is actually um, uh, interesting. So, uh, as you say, Sickle is, is based on top of OpenCL. So, um, no, OpenCL no, ships uh, in a bunch of places. OpenCL, to remind folks if they're not so um, familiar, it's a, first of all, it's very different to um, CUDA or Vulkan. Now, C CUDA and Vulkan are aimed at GPUs specifically. Um, and OpenGL, you know, which is the, the previous generation to Vulkan. Uh, OpenCL is um, a heterogeneous parallel programming environment. So if you have, what does heterogeneous mean? It means you have a mixture of different processing architectures and on a system and you want to bring them all into um, the, uh, use them all in your parallel computation you know, to make your application go faster. So um, you might have multi-core CPUs, you might have a GPU or more, one or more. You might have DSPs, FPGAs, even dedicated no, hardware blocks. And OpenCL um, is a low-level programming framework that gives you um, the choice of some languages to write your small kernel operations that are going to run in parallel. Uh, we call them kernel programs. And you can write them in op OpenCLC, which is a C variant as close to the C as we can make it, or now uh, with OpenCL 2.2, OpenCL C++. And C++ gives you a lot more um, uh, expressiveness in the uh, in the language. Um, you can write your kernel programs in OpenCL C, C++, and then you have an API that lets you compile those programs for the different pieces of hardware in your system send the kernels down to execute in parallel on the available resources. Again, there can be lots of different types of processors in you know, all operating at the same time, potentially, and then bringing back, uh, bringing back the results. So um, for a certain class of developer who wants that level of control, um, OpenCL you know, is kind of unique and you know, lets you, you know, um, do this heterogeneous uh, programming. For, for, for many people, though, of course, that's way too much detail. <laughs> and Sickle <laughs> is uh, a library that sits on top of OpenCL and will generate all of your code for you. The developer just has to write standard C++. And um, totally standard C++. And that's, that there, there are a few, you know, there are some other good initiatives out there in the industry like C++ AMP from um, Microsoft, where you have you know, some small additions to C++ to indicate where the parallelism is. Um, Sickle is similar, but Sickle says, we, we want to achieve that effect. We want to let the programmer indicate where the, where the parallelism is, but using totally standard uh, C++. So you know, using uh, pragmas and templates, um, no, Sickle has managed to achieve that. So if I'm a Sickle programmer, I can just write totally standard C++ you know, uh, using some of the C++ language constructs to say, you know, this is the part that I think might be good to parallelize. Then the Sickle compiler will take that program and distribute it out into the various OpenCL devices that you have 
using the you know, OpenCL compilers to get those kernels to run on the right piece of hardware. And the reason it is getting quite a lot of uh, interest from the deep learning community is that most of the, uh, the training frameworks um, are actually written in C++. Um, so uh, this is a fairly easy way for people to, you know, if they have a C++-based tr training framework, um, to not have to go down to the level of OpenCL, uh, the detailed level. They can just you know, change a few things in their program using standard C++, so your program will still compile and run on your CPU as normal if you want it to. Uh, but they can also have the option of getting it to run uh, uh, accelerated with a bunch of different offload processors, uh, depending on what you have in your system. Awesome. Um, in the HPC and general compute space, obviously CUDA is pretty standardized at the moment. Yep. Um, and NVIDIA have a lot of tools. For example, you've got Insight, which um, is it's a development environment for GPUs. And so what this allows you to do is, as you mentioned, heterogeneous compute, uh, graphics, virtual reality, and this can run uh, pretty much anything from C, C++, OpenCL, uh, DirectX, Vulkan, OpenGL, uh, and so on. I, I guess the industry seems to just be working so fast in in the, all of this, and it's just it's really fascinating that we have all of these tools available. Some of these tools just seem to have come along so so quickly. I guess you could say the ecosystem seems to be evolving so fast. Would you agree? Yeah, I, I do agree. At the um, and I think it does come back back to the realization that the um, Having an awesome piece of technology that is so complex that no developer can afford uh, to the time or the effort to to utilize it you know, is not going to get widely used, and you know, that's true for GPUs you know, with, with rendering and um, you know, other devices, including GPUs, but other devices too for general parallel computation. You know, the parallel programming is non-trivial. Um, and so, you, know, you need to provide good tools for the developers that are um, you know, trying to get parallel systems uh, to work. And you know, the it 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 is interesting. You know, Nvidia you know, is, as you say, very successful in in this area. And I think the that success does come from the fact that Nvidia was probably you know, one of the first to recognise the importance of tools. And languages and compilers uh, to enable people to um, not just theoretically get to the power of the hardware, but you know, in practice, uh, in a feasible economic way, get to the power of the hardware. Um, and so, once you build a tools and developer ecosystem, you know, it it can be a very powerful um, thing in the industry. Um, but you can widen that out to you know. Uh, any uh, API or standard that you know, Kronos or any other group puts together, you know, the realization is that just putting out a specification is no longer enough. You need to have you know, tools and uh, SDKs, and as well as the, the widespread adoption and availability of the standard for for uh, any really any acceleration standard to to be viable. And you know, in Kronos land, the um, Vulkan is kind of the uh, at the vanguard of that revolution. You know, we just launched, as, as we were talking before, Vulkan 1.1, and we were talking about how the ecosystem of tools is is really important. Um, I think you know that's actually a, a le life lesson for you know, for any programming uh, interoperability standard out there. We, you have to invest in the tools and the ecosystem. Uh, you know, a specification by itself doesn't add much value anymore. And in that respect, yes, I agree. The the industry has definitely changed uh, significantly over the last few years. Would you say it's it's difficult in a way for a company, a consortium like Vulcan, because of the ecosystem? And I mean, I remember you mentioned in our last interview that when you have a company, for example, like Microsoft and DirectX Twelve, who obviously have so much resources that they can throw into one specific area. Mm -hmm. How do you, I guess what I'm asking is, how do you not compete, because obviously it's the wrong word, but how do you 
Um, how do you all work together? Because Vulcan is a consortium. You have Nvidia, you have you know, ARM, AMD, and all of these major players working together to work together towards this standard. So how does that actually function? Like, how do you decide what that standard is, and how do you all comp um, you know, work together to uh, improve the ecosystem so that once again you do have this tool suite that you do allow you know the support and the the ecosystem that um, is so is so as you point out so paramount yeah no it's a it's a great question and, and we're learning if you have any ideas let, let me know <laughs> no. <But> the... <laughs> no we we are learning i mean i think we're making good progress i mean again vulcan is kind of the uh uh, the really the, the the first of our kernel standards that made the transition from kind of being specification focused to being ecosystem uh, focused. The I think there's a couple of critical ingredients. You know, first of all, you have to have the specification it has to be something that people care about, and you know that's you know, sometimes not trivial to know. <laughs> you know, Kronos has had you no. Know, many successes but we've also had things that you know, didn't quite hit the spot with the industry and you know, didn't didn't get widespread adoption so first of all you, know, you, you need to make sure that you know, we are doing the right thing and I think adoption you know, is is a standard getting you know, widely implemented and used um, is kind of the critical measure of that because that means that people are going to be willing to you know, invest um, some effort uh, into helping to build an ecosystem because you know, it's in their own best interests you know they they need it for their in, for their business you know so some level of investment is going to make sense so you have then a, a bunch of companies that with the right standard at the right time are motivated to you know invest you know to different degrees depending on you know, uh, different companies situations um so then if you get to that stage that's good that that's you know probably the hardest part then you need to figure out, okay, how do we, you know, we have a bunch of motivated, willing companies who want to cooperate. How do we enable that, you know, from a pure mechanical point of view? How do we do it? <laughs> and in that respect, I think, you know, uh, again, Vulcan lead, leading the way, open source is a tool that, um, and I think it's quite an enabling tool that en enables that cross uh, company cooperation. Um, Would you say it's almost a linchpin in some respects? Because I think to me, it, it, it's not that like, it's not that Vulcan is obviously the be all and end all of Kronos, mm -hmm. but it it feels to be almost like a pioneering effort in like your re almost like you're rethinking your strategy. I guess is the best way of describing it. Yeah, yeah, and I think that comes from the reason that the industry need was so acute that we you know the, the level of motivation and attention we're getting from the industry. Know, was sufficient we could you know, take this next step and yeah I think it is kind of pivotal it, it's a, one of the best ideas we've come up with so far to enable multi-company cooperation on SDKs and tools and um, you know, all the other you know, ecosystem moving pieces that, that we need um, there, there's there's often uh, quite a lot of confusion and I am understandable confusion um, you know, difference between an open standard and open source um, and you know, are they the same and do they compete and the answer is they're definitely different you know as an open specification you know is a cooperative effort where you have multiple companies you know, creating a specification document is the contract if you like how two things are going to interoperate at Kronos that tends to be how are the software people are going to interoperate with the hardware people you know that's kind of the contract that we're writing is a lot of care and detail, crossing the T's and dotting the I's on precisely how that's going to happen. And you can have an open, st and it, it, what makes it open is that you have a multi-company governance model. So it's not one company saying, this is how it's going to work, you know, and you know, like, it'll, like it'll leave it. You know, it's multiple companies come together, you know, typically one company, one vote, you know, no one can block it, everyone has an equal say. So the open governance model makes that an open specification. You don't need to have any open source. You know, and OpenGL, you know, for many years, didn't have any open source. I mean, that Mesa came on, on the scene, but all of the um, 
primary drivers from you know the hardware vendors were being done in in house and and not typically not open sourced but now you know we we're in a different world and um we can use open source as a complementary tool to the open standard so the open standard is kind of is kind of the the, the jewel in the crown because that's what everything else you know, ripples out from but you need to have that specification surrounded by um, good tools. Some of them are going to be proprietary still. Of course, no one is saying that people shouldn't differentiate with their own tools if they wish to. That's awesome. But for the general ecosystem and intercompany cooperation on software uh, tools, which is software, um, you know, and the open source model, I think, is is really quite enabling. And you know, Kronos is increasingly using open source uh, to build the ecosystem around specifications like like Vulkan um, you know and that's the interesting uh, learning process that we're in right now we've done specifications for a long time um, uh, now we've done open source for a few years and you know, I think we're um, you know, the Vulkan ecosystem is is actually awesome <laughs> we have dozens of companies now cooperating but I think you know that's our learning curve we're going up now is how can we use it open source as a tool even more effectively I think industry if I mean from my point of view as like an outsider almost looking in it's I remember this is going back quite a long time but like in the late 90s and we saw obviously you know the the voodoo ones and the voodoo twos and I, I remember I was like literally drooling seeing uh, Tomb Raider and Quake mm -hmm. 1 running on Voodoo, and obviously back then there was multiple competitors in the industry. There was like the, the rendition chipset and the Voodoo chipset, and uh, I remember there was like you know mini drivers to get like the Voodoo uh, cards to run on OpenGL, and it was always a pain in the butt. And uh, then later games you had multiple renderers, and it got you know God help you if your game, you know if you happen to buy a card that was like that card that just wasn't supported. Like I think it was Power mm -hmm. VR. They just got pretty much decimated in industry because there was no, um, there was no unification. There was, uh, you know, standardization of APIs was really, it, it just wasn't commonplace. And now we're in this position where, as you said, it's so much more the ecosystem. And we as consumers, we as gamers, we as software developers, we as you know, cloud even mainframes it, it's 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 we're benefiting us i guess what you can say it's like the whole ecosystem thrives when we're all on the same page mm -hmm. yeah and it's pretty awesome yeah i mean we are literally surrounded I mean, you mentioned we're surrounded by ai which is true but we're you know we're even more surrounded by standards that <laughs> they affect every single micro facet of your life you know plugging in i'm just not in technology you know obviously there's all kinds of standards that the industrial world has been built on for hundreds of years so um yeah no standards are you know the forgotten heroes <laughs> <laughs> all right i'm going to leave you one last question yeah so it's currently well as i'm recording this march 2018 um and obviously you can't reveal all the plans but what are your hopes for in terms of chronos what you would like to achieve over the next 12 months that's a great question. So, um, I think you know, in, in in general, the um, Kronos is 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 a. I I often say this, but I I really mean it. Kronos is a means, not an end, right? So the we we need Kronos to be successful because you know it's a useful because it's useful to the industry. It's a place where you know, companies can come and cooperate. You know, take a break from the good competition out there. You know, because there are things like we were just talking. Standards are enabling the right standards at the right time can really ignite market opportunities for everybody. So you know, we need these cooperative standards organisations, and there are many of them. Of course, Kronos is just one. But in the end, you know, the it's not. That Kronos, you know, is successful. It's the fact that the the work that we do creates the standards that enables the industry to be successful. That's why 
That's why we exist. Um, so, in that in that larger context, you know, we 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 want to continue to find the the pain points, the opportunities in the industry where interoperability standards can move the needle and make a difference to um, how people ship products, how consumers you know, enjoy and get utility from th those products. And we need to keep current. So I think Vulcan is definitely uh, addressing a key area, which is you know, GPU acceleration. That That is you know, something that's central to a lot of markets, and that's why there's a lot of in interest on it. I am actually still a firm believer in the heterogeneous um, programming uh, need, you know, OpenCL, you know, very different to Vulkan, but addressing an, an important area. Um, I'm totally you know, enamored with 3D on the web. You know, WebGL and GLTF are kernel standards, and um, the web community is going through this transitional phase where how do we go from you know, older generation OpenGL to new, new, newer generation APIs? There's a lot of interesting uh, navigation through um, how we make that happen in a in a way that's good for um, developers. That's a fascinating area, and I'm hopeful that kernels can you know, continue to be a force for good uh, there. Uh, but then, uh, kind of coming back to kind of where, where we started, the AI, vision processing, neural networks, deep learning, is going to be you know, the the foundational technology for so many things, and there are going to be so many needs for different types of interoperability standards. The um, so, in parallel with keeping all of the you know, uh, established standards, we need to make sure that we're really figuring out what we can best do to help the industry as a whole move forward in you know, this, this new domain of vision processing and, and neural networks. We have a great start you know, in NNEF and uh, OpenVX uh, for, for inferencing. Uh, sickle, you know, all these things, they're all adding value, but you know, neural nets is going to get a large and larger part of uh, the industry, so we need to make sure that you know, we're adding value there where it counts.